what brought you to India and how do you feel being here in Chennai? I love being here in India. I've been here 20 times for my wow. spiritual journeys. It's a, I was the uh, personal assistant to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I lived with him for nine years as I was growing up. And uh, he was my mentor, teacher, and then I left and became a relationship expert. It was um, spirituality taught me inner peace, right. and then I was able to come out and teach men and women to find peace together. Right. And when it comes to your book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, it always comes back to that. And uh, it's one of those books that you'll find on everybody's you know, bookshelf, including most Indians that I know. So when you wrote the book, did you think that it would have such a worldwide impact? Well, when I wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, I had no idea that it would be so applicable and mm -hmm. practical in 200 different countries around the world, because I hadn't been to 200 countries. Correct. But just uh, men and women in America, when I was working with them, these ideas would help improve their relationships overnight. And people would say, I got more out of one session with you than years of counseling. And people would come to my workshops who were getting divorced, and they would be not getting a divorce at the end. And today, 20 years later, they say they're still using those principles. So at the time when I wrote the book, I thought it would be, a, I hoped it would be a bestseller in America. I had no idea that it would be such a phenomenal bestseller, even 20 years later, still a bestseller in many countries. Right. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what went into putting the book together. Obviously, a lot of research. You seem to, well, love the human mind. So tell us a bit about that. Well, the, the journey of writing Men from Mars started by being a yogi mm -hmm. and learning to find inner happiness. And then when I started having relationships with women, I was able to not come from the place of needing their love, but wanting to share. And th there was much less blame. And, you know, when things seemed weird, I would take time to understand them because I was already happy within myself. And most people don't have that foundation before they start having an intimate relationship. And I was in the beginning as a counselor, I was doing a lot of what they taught in the school. And none of it was working. I was teaching men to get in touch with their feelings. All the women wanted men to get in touch with their feelings. Well, when I, was, when I taught men how to do that, then the women would come back and say, you know, I feel like he's a child. I'm not turned on to him. Or they would say things like, when I married him, I didn't realize he had so many problems. Or now I feel like I have to walk on eggshells or whatever I say or do will upset him. So I, then I decided to do the opposite of what they teach in school and teach men rather than to share their feelings, learn how to listen to a woman's feelings. Learn how to make it safe for her to open up and develop something called empathy for her rather than always wanting to talk about your problems. Right. And what I found is that when men are able to be successful in making their wives happy, a man's stress level goes down and he feels good just doing that. He doesn't have to do all this complaining. But for women, sharing what's going on inside is a big part of, of being able to cope with the stress of our modern life. Right. And you have a lot of men who always say, Women want to talk about a problem, and when we offer a solution, they don't actually want this solution. They just want us to listen. So is that something you hear a lot of when you talk to couples who are having problems with their relationships? Well, one of the reasons people say that is that was one of the breakthrough ideas 20 years ago in Men from Mars. And I helped people just see what was going on, which is, and now I have the science to explain it as well. I didn't have it then, but I just pointed out to the men, look. Women cope with stress. One of the ways they cope with stress is by talking about what's bothering them. If they talk about it, they can let go of it and feel good. Men don't cope with stress that way generally on Mars. If there's a problem, you solve it. If there's nothing you can do to solve it, then forget it until you can do something. So when women are upset, we say, why don't you just forget it or do this and you want to worry about it. He thinks that's what she's needing. That's not what she's needing. What she's needing is someone who can listen and ask more questions, and then she'll feel better. But women have to also learn how to do that because they're not always the best at doing it. You can, men can only hear so much, so, and you need to remind him, really, you don't have to say anything, just listen to me, and I'll feel better. If she does that, he can do that. Right. Is there ever a time when a guy is allowed to say, okay, enough complaining, stop? <laughs> yes, and but there's a way to do it so okay. you don't hurt someone's feelings. Here's one way when a woman is... Let's say she's complaining and, and he's starting to take it personally, like she's complaining about him. And it's very uncomfortable to hear that. He can say, let's pause for a moment because I know you love me and I know you appreciate many things I do. But it's starting to sound like I don't do anything right. So would, can we just stop for a moment and you tell me some of the good things that I do? 
and then come back to the complaining. Or, and I wouldn't call it complaining. I say, and then come back to sharing what's sharing. going on because I really want to understand what you're feeling. And then it's up to her then to stop and talk about all the positive things and then come back and share. If she can't come back to positive things, then, well, let's take some time out and remember our love for each other and all the good things we do, and then we can talk about this again. Right. That's how you prevent arguments and fights. Right. Now, the book was written and published a while ago. People are still reading it, but I'm sure over the years there are many things that you have continued to learn, right? Yes. Maybe you could share a few of those things with us. What have you learned, say, in the last 15 years? <laughs> well, since I wrote Men Are From Mars, there's lots of things I've learned. However, that book was the, the result of 10 years of seeing it improve relationships. So there's nothing I need to change in that. My publisher says, is there anything wrong in that book? No, there's not. But I've written about 15 books since then, yep. applying those ideas to dating, to marriage, to serious problems in a relationship, to your sex life, to parenting. These are all like very important aspects of relationships, which I didn't completely focus on in that book. I just focused on the basic understanding of how men and women come from different direction and how we can understand each other in a more positive way. And in addition, I've taught about how men and women now have challenges in the workplace. You know, my book, Mars Venus in the Workplace, How to Get What You Want at Work. I've got a book coming out this year called Work With Me, which talks about uh, nine blind spots between men and women. For example, when we go into corporations, we've gone in all these Fortune 500 corporations and we interview the people. And we find conclusions. 80, 90% of women in big corporations feel that men don't appreciate them. And you ask the men, do you appreciate the women? And 80 to 90% of men say, we do appreciate women. So that's called a blind spot. So why is it that the men are not effectively communicating their appreciation to women? And why is it that women think they're not appreciated? So this is like a challenge, which I help couples solve or help people in the workplace solve. It's also a challenge at home. Women often feel unappreciated. Very much so. And often men don't appreciate women in the way that women need to be appreciated. So that's what I have to teach is how we're different in terms of getting our emotional needs met. But what I've really learned a lot in the last 15 years is so exciting for me. It keeps me interested in this. You know, I mean, I've been teaching it for almost 30, over 30 years. Is, uh, well, one thing keeps it interesting is so many people just light up and go, oh my gosh, I didn't know this. And so that's pretty exciting. But I need to be learning and growing and it's amazing every week or every month some new scientific study has been done at a university showing that women's hormones are different or men's hormones are different or women have a different health challenge and men have a different health challenge and, and so I'm an expert in natural solutions for men and women's health. I'm an expert in managing stress effectively for men and women and then also how our brains are different like the emotional part of the brain is twice as big in a woman than a man. Then I can so uh, how did you deal with critics over the years? A lot of people had not so nice things to say about your book. Even though the book was doing really well, the public was buying it. But a lot of people actually had problems with you saying that men and women are so different. How did you deal with that? They, they still do. <laughs> uh, last week on Valentine's Day, there was a documentary that came out that said the same thing you said. It said thousands of couples we interviewed, hundreds we interviewed, all love the material. They say it helped their relationship, save their marriage. And yet we asked the experts... And it's all wrong. Who are these experts that are, say it's all wrong? They're people that live in an academic bubble. And how do I deal with it? I have a loving wife. Nice. And I have a great relationship. So personally, I get the love and support I need to handle the battles I fight. Two, I know this stuff has worked for me because I have a great marriage because of it. And three is I have an ongoing counseling practice. And every week I save somebody's marriage. I have a waiting list. People say, thank you, thank you so much for what you do. And the reason my books sell is because people go, this book helped me and I want to share it with somebody to help them. Maybe not so surprised to know that the last four couples that I met who just recently got married, each of them said that the, one of their wedding presents was men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So it's like a standard wedding gift as well, even here in India. It is. You know, it was like uh, there was uh, when Tom Cruise got married, uh, they asked Oprah and Oprah wasn't invited. They, so their, the press was all saying, well, you weren't invited, and uh, what, do you, what will you do about that? And she said, oh, I'm sure, you know, they thought I was busy, and but I'll send a president. And they said, what president are you going to send? I'll send them men from Mars, women from <laughs> Venus. <laughs> it's a definitely great wedding, wedding gift, but it's, right. a, it's kind of the classic fallback right. to make sure that a relationship has a good chance.
like you said, I think I've read in a lot of places. You've said the basis of what people want from a marriage is the same, no matter which country or part of the world you come from. But I've noticed that a lot of people have asked you about the concept of arranged marriages and whether that changes, you know, how you uh, say would deal with a couple. Does it? Uh, well, with arranged marriage, uh, the success of the marriage some extent has to do with uh, how good your parents are in picking for you. Mm -hmm. But uh, either way, whether it's a love marriage or a arranged marriage, your chances of creating a soulmate, passionate relationship are the same. Many young people, just the newness of the relationship, the excitement of the sex and all that, they think they're in love. And then after about three or four years, they find out, can we make the love? Can we grow in love? And people who arrange marriage, they start out that way. Right. And often they don't have the unrealistic expectations that cause so many people to get divorced. You know, all you need is this sort of fantasy of the perfect person, my soulmate, and then you're disappointed when reality sets in and many people get a divorce, people that start out. Now those people still can make it work if they have relationship skills. What I teach people is how to keep the passion and the romance alive. And for people that are in arranged marriages, if they don't know how to awaken the passion, they'll also be disappointed in their lives and may get a divorce. But with my message, if, if you care about someone, you can grow in love. And as you grow in love, you can keep increasing passion. It has a lot more to do with skills than just meeting the right person. Is there something you'd like to say to all of our listeners out there, all of those young couples? I know a lot of young people who are either just about to get married or they just got married. What would you like to say to them? Well, for young couples who are just about to get married, remember that today lots of people are getting divorced because they're not prepared. So don't rush into it and make sure you've taken some time to understand the skills of making a marriage work. Because in the beginning, just because there's newness, the feelings are much stronger. There's automatic love and acceptance and we think everything's going to be fine. But we also have to realize that when the newness goes away, it's up to us to create the romance and the passion. So in short, in the beginning stages, romance is automatic, but after that, you need to do something to create it. And don't feel bad if it goes away. Just know that now you can start generating it.